Hey everyone, welcome to the last day of April's recording on One Single Story. It's uh, April the 30th, day 120. Almost, I guess, two more days will be over two-thirds of the way. I mean, one-third of the way through. So, we're in Psalm 102 today. That's going to be the passage that we take from your reading. And um, I'll, I'll read, I don't know, four or five lines from it, and then we'll just kind of start having a discussion. It says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea. Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. So he begins by saying, Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my plea. Um, it's almost like he's prefacing what he's got to say is, I want to make sure, you know, did you pick up the other end of the line? Do you feel like that's necessary when we pray? God, are you listening? God, will you listen? God, please listen. Is, is that necessary when we call on God? Or is it only necessary in certain times? Or is it just his form of style of writing? I think it's for our benefit that we, we say these things and, and do these things. You know, um, God is God. He's everywhere. He sees. He hears all. I think it helps us when, when we do that. Um, you know, sometimes we talk to people and we say, hey, I know I really need you to lean in, listen to what I'm saying and focus. And um, that's for our benefit. You know, for other people, it may be legitimate. We need to get their attention before they can listen to us. But in this situation, I think it's 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 the person's benefit for saying these things. It makes them feel better. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that it's necessary, but I, sometimes we probably feel desperate. Do you do it? I mean, like, have you ever prayed that way? I'm just curious. I'm not trying to put I you on the spot. I can't say that I have. I was just thinking about that. I, I know that I have thanked God for listening a lot. Just I have begged I, God to hear me. Yeah, I, I have. And for me, it, it's almost like I'm trying to present to him the intensity of right. what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. right. Like he doesn't know the difference. But like, Lord, <laughs> I, I, when I pray, I always mean it. But this, situation this is ramped up. <laughs> yeah. This is really super important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lean in. Lean way in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so verse 4 and 5 says, My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I don't think he's talking about heart disease here. Um, what what does it mean for your heart to be sick, and what are some of the ramifications of heart sickness? Well, he touches on some of this, but you know, we all I think have probably been to that place more than we care to remember. I have. You know where, and he talks about this. Where you don't have an appetite, food doesn't matter anymore to you. You you can't sleep. Nothing else. The things that were so important the day before now mean nothing to you. Um, where it's heart sickness, brokenness, um, grief, whatever label you want to put on it, that it can have a dramatic impact on how we view every other aspect of life. Cheryl, yeah, what does heart sickness mean to you? I mean, he says he's skin and bones. You know, he's like Jay said, he's not eating, and I think it can take over our lives. We can, everything else can be tainted by whatever it is that we're going through that we can't seem to get off of our minds, you know, out of our heart, whatever it is. It could be something terrible that you've done, or it could be something terrible that's happened to you, or the loss of somebody. I think it could be a lot of things, but it feels destructive when you feel that way. Yeah, you know, heart sickness almost is, we may say it, I'm heart sick. We might say my heart is broken. broken. Mm -hmm. um, there are, I think there are probably a multitude of ways we could say it, but usually it is because we've been dealt some devastating blow. Yeah. Um, something we loved is either gone, hurt, missing, you know, fractured, could be a relationship. Usually, that's when I think about it most is in the context mm -hmm. of relationships where your heart, your heart broken. Um, it could be at the loss of something, you know. You, 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 but it affects you physically. It's mm -hmm. not. 
Well, even like I, I was reading recently how many spouses die within a short period of the other spouse, especially when they're older. And they called it heart sickness mm-hmm. that, you know, nothing physically ailed them, but their heart was broken to the point that they, they struggled to function. And I think we have to be aware of it. I think we are conscious of it when we're heartbroken, yeah. but we're not as empathetic with people when their hearts are yeah. broken. Um, so he, in verse 3 and then later in verse 11, that those are kind of, I want to tie the two together. He says, my days disappear like smoke. And then in verse 11, he says, my life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I'm withering away like grass. Um, do we make life out to be longer than it really is? Because over and over again, it talks about its breath. It's breathing. Yeah. yeah. It's, a vapor. it's like it, it withers like the grass. Yeah, it's it's dew on the ground in the morning. Yeah. Um, why do we make life so consequential when it's so brief? You mean in our minds? Yeah, in our. Yeah, just in life. Like people will spend thousands of dollars to extend their life one more day. Just, just another day. Mm-hmm. Knowing that in, in the whole concept of eternity, it's, it's brief. Mm-hmm. Why do we go to such great lengths to try to extend something that's brief on its best days? I think fear probably has a lot to do with it. Fear of? Death. Okay. And why do you think we're afraid of death even as believers? The unknown. Right. Not knowing exactly how it's going to play out. Sure. You know, I, I think that's a big part of it, Um I recently had a conversation with a gentleman who knew he was dying, uh, and he he said he wasn't afraid of dying. He just would the uncertainty of the process sure. would what mm-hmm. had him on edge a little bit. And um, you know, there's a survival instinct built into us that I think uh, perpetuates that. You know, constantly trying to get all you can out of life and as long as you can. But when re- in reality, it it is so brief. Yeah, it is. And we don't realize it. The older you get, you know, we talk about how fast life goes. I uh, recently mentioned I was riding in the car with my oldest grandson who's 10. He'll be 11 in a couple months. And I said, you're going to be 11 in a couple months. He said, Poppy. He said, 10 has gone by so fast. <laughs> and I was like, you, know you have no yeah, idea, yeah. buddy. Yeah. You know, wait till 10 years starts going by so fast, uh-huh. you know. Um, and because I was in the in the same day, someone asked me how long I'd been living in the house I lived in. I said, fourteen years mm-hmm. this year, and it seems like yesterday yeah. almost that you know that 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 we moved there. So he says, let this verse eighteen says, let this be recorded for future generations, so that the people not born yet will praise the Lord. Tell them the Lord looked down from his heavenly sanctuary. He looked down to earth below to hear the groans of the prisoners to release those condemned to die. This has been a common theme lately. Mm-hmm. Sermons, podcasts. Yeah. Um, let this be recorded for future generations so the people not born yet will praise the Lord. What are some ways that we can be intentional? Because we've talked about the need for it. What are some ways that we can be intentional of making sure generations from now have knowledge of God. I think in many ways that we live our lives, you know, reading the Bible together as a family or with each other, making it a priority, sharing your stories like we've talked about before, making sure they know how faithful God's been to you. You know, as he talks about be recorded for future generations, you know, the stories we tell, but writing those stories down um, so that there's a tangible thing to look at. Um, Recording videos. I I have seen instances where people recorded videos because they they wanted to leave something that could be seen and reheard by family members, you know, in the future to about who they were and how they felt about those people, etc. So there, there are practical ways that we can do that. Yeah, you talk can. about recording videos. I saw one of the most unusual things I had. I have I had never seen it before. 
I'm sure I'll see it again in the technology age that we live in, but it was a gentleman who died. And in the past five years, I don't know when he had recorded it, but it would have been in the last five years that he recorded it. He sat down and recorded a video that played at his funeral. Mm -hmm. And he said, these are the things, I don't know what anybody will say today, mm -hmm. but I want you to know what was important yep. to me. And he listed off like five things that he wanted people to remember, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it wasn't things he had done or accomplished. Mm -hmm. They were things that he thought were important, yep. you know, about loving your family and mm -hmm. following after God. And, um, you know, I, I think we live in an age where we have um, the ability to record things in a way. I mean, I think back then how they were doing it, how complicated it was, mm -hmm. you know. Today, we can type it in a computer, um, you know, record a video, record an audio, like these recordings we're doing right now. They're gonna be around forever, right. somewhere. Somewhere. Um, and and the speed of it, I, I, I just finished a book. We uploaded it, and the question it asked when we uploaded it to the publisher is do we want pre published copies so we can review what the whole thing looks like. And three days later, I had five copies of that mm -hmm. book at my house. Through, from the day we uploaded right. it to, to right. receiving the copies. Mm -hmm. And it was it's incredible how fast things are. And so we can record um, for future generations in multiple ways. Um, you know, John Maxwell's one of my heroes and he's written lots and lots of books, sold millions and millions of copies but he says one of the reasons I write books is because they'll touch people I'll never see and they'll touch people long after I'm dead yeah. you know and um, I think that's we have no excuse not to record somewhere you know I think even you know because a lot of people are probably thinking well you know I'm not a writer or not I, I don't journal per se but something as simple as on an individual's birthday or an anniversary what you write in a card or mm -hmm. uh, I occasionally will write a, a, a brief letter to say one of my children on their birthdays, things that are important to me and that I'm feeling that I want to convey to them. And you know that that stuff is being held on to and preserved, it's important. And, and in the future, there'll be opportunities to look back at those things and they, I think, will mean more to them then than they perhaps they even do now. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of practical little ways that yeah. when um when Lauren and Cameron graduated from school, I gave them a little laminated card of 10 things that I thought were important about life. And Cameron still carries it, it's tattered now, it's mm -hmm. ragged, but he still carries it in his wallet. But you know, those things right. are important. Mm -hmm. So the last, um, the last verse says, the children of your people will live in security, that your, their children's children will thrive in your presence. What does it mean to live in security and to thrive? And how does one affect the other? I think that they're referring to God again and their relationship with him and his with them and how he's going to protect them and give them, you know, peace and security. That that is where it's going to come from for them is their relationship with him. Yeah, and I, and I don't think even in, in this sense that living in security is the absence of turmoil or strife no. or things no. around you. It, it's in spite of that. You know, take our world, you know, in the last two years with all that has transpired that you can still live in security even when everything is just seemingly falling to pieces around you. Um, but you can still have security even in the midst of that. And that is something that you can convey and pass on. You know, we've heard so much about passing things on generationally. How we choose to live and respond in the midst of chaos is being observed and absorbed mm -hmm. by those under our influence, you know, Bob. And what a great legacy to, to pass on. Yeah, I, I think people function better in secure environments. Absolutely. And whether it's marriage, you know, marriage when you feel secure in your marriage, you're gonna thrive. When children feel secure at home, they're gonna they're gonna thrive in school. 
And I think when we understand the security that we have in God, not the absence of turmoil, turmoil right. or the attacks or fights, but the security that we have that no matter what comes my way, I can trust him. We're able to thrive. Yeah, you know, even, you know, we talked about the brevity of life early on in, in, in this uh, talk, that when you realize that what lies ahead for us as believers, that it can bring a great deal of security and peace in, in this present world that we live in. Uh, you know, and you don't get so wrapped up in, oh, I've only got just a few years left or a few days left because your future is secure. Yeah, you? it's good. Well, let's, uh, let's close in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the assurance that we have through Jesus Christ, the assurance in our hearts that we can rest in you, we can find security in you, that allows us to thrive in this present world, to, to function in the calling and the understanding that you have for us. I pray, God, that we would be faithful to that, that we would be faithful to um, to work uh, in, in the calling that you have, have given to us and that we would walk faithfully in that and that we would be faithful to pass along the good things that you have done for us, the, the ways that you came through for us, the way that you helped us and kept us. God, help us to be faithful in those things as we, as we share uh, with our children for generations uh, the goodness of God. Jesus.